Turn to Proverbs 2.13. Proverbs 2.13. Get through 13 and 14 tonight, Lord willing. It says, Who leaveth or who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. And we're talking about evil men here that we're to be delivered from, deliver us from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness. So this is a <clears throat> this and the next verse give us a description of quite vivid one of what evil men are and, and what we can look for to identify them. And the first thing is here they leave the paths of uprightness. And I want you to notice something here that they leave the paths. So what does that tell you? They were on them. They, they were, were on, on them, right? Yeah. Which is interesting because and I I didn't notice that until I noticed it here a couple of years ago or something that that you think of evil men not being on the path, right? But they actually were on the path. And there's two different ways in which an evil man can be on the path, or two different types of evil men, I guess we could say, that can be on the path, and we'll look at that yet tonight. So they leave the paths of uprightness, and to uh, the uprightness means the state or condition of being sincere, honest, or just, equity or justness in respect of principle or practice, upright quality or conduct, moral integrity, or rectitude. <clears throat> that definition would be uh, something that if you found somebody like that, you want to be friends with that guy, or you want to work for that guy, or you want to be in a church with that guy, or whatever. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good man that that, descri- that that definition describes there. If you remember in Proverbs 2.8, we defined what paths were, and they are courses of action or procedure, lines of conduct, ways of behavior. So if we put it all together, then paths of uprightness, putting the definitions in there, are courses of action and behavior in life that are honest, just, and characterized by moral integrity. <clears throat> so, strangely enough, you have wicked people walking those paths, which that makes it even even more odd that they would be on paths that are honest and just and morally integrated. And Integrous. I don't even know what the word would be for that. But anyway, um, they have moral integrity. <clears throat> so this would be like the straight and the narrow way that Jesus talked about that leadeth unto life. If you look in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Solomon and, and Christ here are describing the same thing. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, Straight means of a way or passage or channel, so narrow as to make transit difficult. So it's very uh, narrow there, tight, like a straight jacket, right? I lost my place here. Uh, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So these wicked people are actually walking through the straight gate for a time. They're on the narrow way. And this is the path that good men walk, or at least it appears that they're good men when they're walking it. But sometimes there are bad men that are walking these paths for a a time. And so there's really two possibilities here. You can either have righteous men who backslide into sin and veer off the path, right? Right? Or you could have wicked men who walk on it for a time for some advantage that they can get, some personal advantage, but they never really had a right to to be on that path in the first place. So it can be righteous people that fall off or wicked people that somehow manage to fall onto it and eventually go back to where they came from. So the righteous man that veers off the path, he could veer back on. Right. As long as he doesn't go too far. Right, yeah. Yeah, as long as he doesn't get stuck in the ditch entirely. And if you think about it, it's well, why would I call a righteous man evil? But yet Jesus had a lot of pretty pointed things to say, and well, especially back in the Old Testament of Israel, where God had some some pretty bad things to say about His own people, and what their their actions would certainly be counted as evil um, with their idolatry and and things like that. So a good man can could be described as evil, certainly. Jesus said, if ye, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, he was talking to his own followers. So. so the Bible does tell us about both types of men, and it warns us to 
take heed that we don't become the former and to be careful to avoid the latter. So we don't want to become the righteous that fall off the path. We want to stay away from the wicked that end up on it for a short time. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of each of these. <clears throat> so in the first one, we have righteous people that fall off the path. Um, Solomon's a good example of that. And I'm just going to, I have the, the quotes here in the, in the outline. I won't take it to him because we've read them quite a few times in this series because of the author of the book is Solomon. So it's interesting that Solomon, given all the wisdom, then ends up falling off the path himself. But in 1 Kings 4.29, it says that, Sol, that God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and large, largeness of heart even as the sand that is on the seashore. So he was a good man walking on the path but then he falls off. It's almost like the, the women that he was walking on the path next to just kind of shoved him off or pulled, maybe, maybe pulled him off, not shoved him off because they probably weren't on the path themselves being um, idolaters. But then it was said there in, in 1 Kings 11 and verse 4 that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. What did they do? They turned away his heart. He's walking on the straight and narrow, and he gets turned away, right, to one direction or the other. <clears throat> then you have Israel. God delivered them out of Egypt, and it said that they, by faith, passed through the Red Sea as by dry ground. So they were on the path, walking right between the water, right? But then they end up dying in the wilderness because of their sin and their rebellion, because of their unbelief. So they fell off the path. And we've read that quite a few times too in 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 10 and Hebrews 3, 17 through 19. So we won't read those, but it says that they did not enter in because of unbelief. So they fell off the path. They were destroyed by the destroyer as, as um, Paul quotes there in 1 Corinthians 10. So these examples here should make us be not high-minded but fear because if Solomon, if Israel in the wilderness, people like that can fall off the path, of righteousness, well, then we can too. Look in uh, Romans 11 and verse 20. This would probably be one of those verses that would be good to just have memorized, kind of tucked away in the back of your mind to remind yourself every now and then um, whenever we start thinking about how, how good we are because we're in the true church and others aren't or something. And, and we're blessed to be here, but we could fall off the path just like them. Uh, Romans 11 and verse 20, Paul's referring to the Jews who fell off the path. He said, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, but thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. So, <clears throat> just like Israel was broken out, we can be broken out and they can be brought back in. Wouldn't that be something if somebody in the New Testament church was excluded and then along comes some, some Jewish person and they ended up joining the church right in the place of that person. And I wouldn't put it past God to do something like that just as a, as a direct fulfillment of this verse. That could certainly happen. Yeah. <clears throat> and then 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. This is the warning that Paul gave after he talks about Israel in the wilderness that fell off the path of uprightness. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. He says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Fall out of the way. Fall off the path. And then we're told in Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Pretty sure that was a direct quote. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Didn't, didn't, let me just check here. Didn't, didn't Jesus say that the broad way and the wide gate doesn't it lead to destruction? Pretty sure that's what it said. Matthew chapter 7. I just want to check on that before I say it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. So pride goeth before destruction. Take heed ye that stand lest ye fall, right? Haughty spirit before a fall. So you end up on that wide path if we're proud of where we are now. Now, Scripture also gives examples of 
wicked men who end up getting into the church for a time and for some benefit, some personal benefit, or just to hide themselves uh, by being religious or something. And I think there are some people like that. There was a, a guy that was excluded from another church of like faith, and I was just so shocked. I didn't even, I didn't even know the guy, but I was so shocked to hear what they found. No, he wasn't excluded. He died. That's what it was. He died, and then they were going through his things, and they found a bunch of stuff. And I'm just like, wow, why would a guy like that, why would he be in this church? Of all the churches you could be in out there, why would you pick the one where you can't celebrate Christmas or, you you know, all this strange stuff and people look at you like you have two heads whenever you tell them what you believe? Why not go join one of these other fun churches or something? And, And the pastor said, well, sometimes they just like to, they, they, it's a place where they can hide out, right? They can go there and wouldn't be suspected of being some reprobate like they are. I don't know. It's interesting. But what did they find? Oh, like filthy, perverse oh, okay. sex stuff. I don't. I forget what. I don't remember the details, but it was. It wasn't good. Whatever. He was not leading a good life, and mm-hmm. and nobody knew about it <clears throat> until after he died. And then in his uh, in his funeral. Pastor Mott said that they resurrected him and then excluded him. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. But I'll give you some examples of some people. Like, for instance, the Pharisees. Remember what Jesus said of them in John eight forty four: Ye are of your father, the devil. Right. So here are people that are definitely not children of God, no doubt. And if you turn to Galatians 4 and verse 2, though, we see that these types, that Jesus called them serpents and vipers and of their father, the devil, Yet these types here, they they crept into the church. Galatians 2 and verse 4, he said, But that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And he's talking here about the Jews. The Jews, remember, were the ones that were trying to bring the Gentiles into bondage. They were trying to teach them that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved, right? Bringing in their work salvation into the church. And, and I don't doubt that these are some of the same people that Jesus was condemning. And if it wasn't them, it was their children, right? Their spiritual children anyway. The same types of, of people crept in there. And, and Jude describes people like that. Crept in unawares. You could really call them creeps and be really accurate with that term. Uh, Jude 1 and verse 4. So for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So these people are, are reprobates. God has, he is, so they, they're going to they're gonna be damned, right? They have before of old been ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so these types here are the types that say, well, I'm saved by grace, therefore I can live however I want. I can do whatever I want. Because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, right? And they're taking, I mean, they could quote that scripture, right? But they're they're misapplying that scripture, right? They're justifying their sin and just saying, hey, I mean, there are people out there. It sounds crazy to us, but there are actually people out there that teach that, that just don't worry about sin. You know, it's all it's all covered. It's You don't have to worry about trying to not sin or living a holy life because... Christ, he died for your sins, are put away. Don't worry about it. Paul says, of those people, their damnation is just. Let us do evil that good may come, he says, whose damnation is just. It seems like if people do that, if we make light of it, then we are condoning stripes. It's almost like you're just saying, yeah, go ahead and lay another one on, and then I'm going to do this. And I know it's already done, and it's in the past, but it's kind of like you're just... I don't know, almost yeah. purposely letting yeah. him suffer more. Yeah. Which I know his suffering is done. Right, it's but done. It's but yeah. Making light of it <clears throat> or something like not remembering right. what it costs. Yeah. And because he, he did indeed suffer for every sin. And so mm-hmm. everyone that we do and and any sin that we do, he suffered for. So you just think about that. You know, you, mm-hmm. would you want to sin again intentionally knowing that? He had to suffer and die for it. Or, then ask yourself, if I really want to sin again intentionally, did he really suffer and die for my sins? (laughs) Right? Because if you act like that and you think like that, you might not be one that he died for. You know? So, that's why Paul said their damnation is just. 
I know of a pastor one time, different type of church, um, that he stopped, and they teach temporal salvation like we do, and he stopped teaching temporal salvation because they had a woman in his church that I think was living in adultery, and he confronted her about it, and she's like, well, I'll just lose my temporal salvation if that's the case, but I won't lose my eternal salvation. And instead of telling her, lady, your damnation is just, he stopped teaching temporal salvation <laughs> because it might be leading people to sin. It's like, oh. you, You've heard of the guy. You, you know his name. I'll tell you later. But, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> These guys are like wolves in sheep's clothing, like Jesus taught in Matthew seven fifteen. They appear like they're walking on the paths of righteousness. <clears throat> They'll talk religiously, but in their heart, they're really not. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They're ministers of righteousness, Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen. He just said that Satan, Satan is transformed into an, into an angel of light, and it shouldn't be any great thing that his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. So just because some guy's up there teaching some, some good things and teaching you how to be a good boy or a good girl or a good father or a good child or a good employee or whatever, um, that's, that's fine, but... <clears throat> You also want to look at his doctrine because Satan's ministers are not going to teach the truth. They're not going to teach the whole truth anyway. They'll mix some truth and error in there, but that's why you always have to look at their doctrine. And we'll look at that. I got a verse for that at the end to show us how we can prove and identify these guys. And here's what they do. <clears throat> they use good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. Look at Romans 16:18. And they end up deceiving a lot of people because, oh, he can preach such a good sermon. It's just so entertaining. It's so interesting. And I just feel like I've been there for five minutes whenever he preaches for an hour. It's just so neat. And he applies it to my life. And it's just wonderful. Well, that's great if he's teaching the truth. right? But if he's not teaching the truth and he's just mixing a little truth in there, watch out. Watch out for that guy. Uh, Romans 16 and verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So they walk on the path for a while, and they deceive a lot of people because they have, they're wearing wool underneath that, over top of that, that wolf's coat. Now the Bible teaches us how to avoid both of these types. So whether the man is an unregenerate reprobate who crept into the church to lead others astray, or whether he's a child of God fallen into sin and gone out of the way, God gives us wisdom through his word which will deliver us from such people. And that's what we've been reading about in Proverbs 2, 10 through 13. I'm not going to read those verses because we've already, we've already read them in the previous weeks. But this is, this is what God gives us the wisdom for, to deliver us from the evil man. Wisdom teaches us, <clears throat> here's how you can so you can figure out if one of these guys is a wolf in sheep's clothing, that we're not supposed to believe every spirit, but we're supposed to try the spirits. Look in 1 John 4 and verse 1. And don't let me forget, I just, just came to mind, I'll give you an example of a church that did this. Uh, 1 John 4 and verse 1. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the world. So you can't just believe every guy that claims to be a preacher. You can't believe every guy that claims to be a convert, right? You want to try the spirits, especially before they get in, right? You try them before they get in. Once they get in, you give them the benefit of the doubt unless they show you otherwise, right? But before they get in, try the spirits, right? I don't, I don't just baptize anybody that say they, says they want to be baptized, I, mean, I I try them and I question them and, and I question them with um, not leading questions. So, I mean, if I just say, do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe in the deity of Christ? Do you believe in sovereign grace? Do you believe in temporal salvation or whatever? Well, yes, yes, yes. Well, anybody can say yes. But you ask them, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about God? How did you get saved? Right, or whatever. And then see what they say and see if they actually understand it themselves at all. You want to try the spirits. 
lots of false teachers out there. Which church are you talking about? Oh, thank you. Uh, in the book of Revelation, and let's see, it's um, it was the the church in Ephesus, Ephesians two and verse two. Revelation. Revelation. What did I say? Ephesians. Oh, Ephesians. I was thinking of Ephesus. Revelation two two. Just follow what I do, not what I say. I turn to Revelation. <laughs> And she saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Revelation 2 2. Jesus says to this church here in Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So they were doing exactly what John told them. Don't, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits whether they're of God. Here there were men that were going around saying that they were apostles. And these guys said, You know, I don't know about that. And they tried them. I'm assuming they tried them by their doctrine, compared it with the letters that Paul and Peter and John had written to them with whatever scripture they had and the teaching that they'd received from the real apostles, and they found these guys out to be liars. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's another one to, probably another one you should have in the back of your mind. So how do you prove all things? How do you hold fast that which is good? You have to measure it by the scripture, right? That's so whenever somebody teaches you something, you go back like a Berean, you search the scriptures daily whether these things are so. You measure every man's words by the scripture. Look at Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Isaiah 8.20 <clears throat> It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you compare it with God's law, his testimony, in other words, his word. And if they don't speak according to that, according means agreeing to or corresponding to or matching. So if they're not speaking things that are in accordance, in agreement with what God says, then there's no light in them. Those men are are false prophets. And Paul said that if any man think himself spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I say are the commandments of the Lord. And what Paul said, he's not me, him. <clears throat> and that's always a, a good one that I like to go to because that was in 1 Corinthians 14. I can get you the verse if, if you want. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14. And in, in, in the context of this is especially important. <clears throat> if you ever run across the charismatic individual, this would be a good one to use. He said, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, I didn't have that quite right when I quoted it, but <clears throat> got the gist of it anyway. Now, this is in the context of people that are speaking in tongues and people that are prophesying in the church. And he says that if somebody thinks they're a prophet or they're a spiritual man, they better acknowledge what I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So when you come across somebody, a charismatic or something, or a pastor of, of some other fake church or something, if you want to test them, just go and say, go take them to Romans chapter 9, for instance, and say, is it true? Does God, did God hate Esau when he was in the womb? Right? Is that true or not? Did he personally hate that man or that boy, that baby, whatever? And if the guy hymns and haws and says, well, no, it doesn't really mean hate just means a lesser degree of love and blah, 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 or whatever, he's not acknowledging that the things that Paul wrote are the commandments of the Lord. Right? So he's showing what's really in him, especially if this is some guy. Now, maybe he's just misguided, but if he's a guy that claims to be a prophet, and there are plenty of them these days in these charismatic churches that claim to be a prophet, speaking by the inspiration of God. Now, if you're speaking by the inspiration of God, you can't be mixed up on something. You can't be like, oh, I just did, I had a misunderstanding of that. No. If, if God's telling you what to say, you can't have a misunderstanding, right? So if some guy, he claims to be a prophet, and he doesn't understand the basics of the, of the gospel, he's a false prophet, obviously. Paul said, if we are an angel of heaven, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. So that's how you try them. And if you want to avoid being led away by the error of the wicked, then 
the, the antidote to that is to grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter kind of ties this in well in Second Peter three seventeen through 18. <clears throat> Second Peter three seventeen and 18. He says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. This is exactly what I've been talking about here for the last 20 or so minutes. Being led away, led off the path, fall from your own steadfastness. Remember, ye that take heed, or take heed, ye that stand, take heed, lest ye fall, right? We've been reading about those verses. Here's what you do. Verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So it always goes back to the Bible, right? Immerse yourself in the Bible, learn more about Jesus Christ, and you won't be led away off the path. Now let's get the second part of that verse, uh, Proverbs 2.13. They um, leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. I want you to notice something here, that if you leave the path of uprightness, there's only one place to go, and that's the path of darkness, right? It's not like you can leave the path of uprightness into the land of spiritual neutrality or something. You're either on the path of righteousness, you're on that straight and narrow way, or else you're on the broad and wide way that leads to destruction. Right? Now, there happens to be on that broad way, there's all kinds of ways that you can go. All, you know, there's lots of area to walk there, and you can go in many different directions, but it's all one big wide road all leading to hell. Right? And then there's one little narrow one leading to heaven. Right? That's, that's the right path. So if you're off the right path, you are on the wrong one, and there's no middle ground there. So when you walk in the ways of darkness, you'd be walking after the devil, who is called the prince of darkness. He's called the prince of the darkness of this world in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. There's really only two religions out there. There's gods and the devils. The devil happens to have a whole bunch of them, but they all belong to him. Uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. says, I was thinking of Ephesians 2, 3, where they walk according to the prince of the power of the air, or the prince of darkness, same, same person. And if you think about it, when somebody is, remember we had the, the, t- the two groups there, we had the, the righteous that are walking on the path, and then they, they veer off of it for some reason, and then the wicked that never should have been on there in the first place. Well, the righteous, whenever they veer off of it, they're excluded from the church, right? And when they're excluded from the church, they are delivered unto Satan, right, for the destruction of the flesh. And they are now walking in the ways of darkness, following the prince of darkness, right? Unless they repent, which is what we hope for them. So if you want to avoid walking in the ways of darkness, then we must follow close behind the Lord Jesus Christ. If you keep a hold of the hem of his garment, keep close to him, then you're never going to be walking on that path of darkness. Look at um, at John 8 and verse 12. John 8, 12. <clears throat> it says, then, say, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And how is it that you follow him? How is it that you figuratively keep hold of the hem of his garment? He tells you here in verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So that's how you follow Christ as you continue in his word. Continue learning of him and believing on him. And then in verse 46, Twelve forty-six. I didn't. John twelve forty-six. I was looking at eight forty-six and wondering what I was thinking. John twelve forty-six. Jesus said, "I am come 
a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. It's no fun to be in darkness. You know, you ever try to walk out there whenever it's pitch black and you can't see where you're going? It can be a frightful thing, especially if you're in certain places in the darkness, right? <clears throat> we don't want to be there. We want to follow Christ in the light. So we should be reproving and avoiding those who walk in these ways of darkness, not maintaining fellowship with them. And the reason is for that, because they'll end up pulling us off the path after them. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says that evil be not deceived, evil communication corrupts good manners. And we're told in Romans 13.12 that we should cast off the works of darkness. Romans 13 and verse 12. Says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I mean, this really ties in there pretty well because you think about it, the evil men, they go off, they, um, how, how did it say it there? They, um, I just forgot. They leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. So they go off the path, and here Paul is writing to New Testament Christians, and he tells them to cast off the works of darkness. Right? So it's certainly possible for these Romans here to veer off that path into the way of darkness. Let's cast that off, nip it in the bud before it gets the best of us. <clears throat> uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Says, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So act like who Christ has made you to be. Don't go back and live like you did before you were converted. And then Paul teaches us that we're not to be unequally yoked together with sinners who.